Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books, the kids' fiction imprint of Cannon Press. One thing I realize that what people may not know about you is that you're an ideas man. <laughs> I was reminded of that. <laughs> ideas? Uh, you always have a new idea. <laughs> You're really? just a constant ideas man. <laughs> I take that line from an old Canadian, I don't know, it was a comedy. And the, the description for one son, it was these rednecks and they just constantly, his dad's always saying, he's an ideas man. He's they an like, ideas <laughs> man. So anyways, I think I think you are an ideas an man. An ideas man. But This is true. I could, I could rattle on, I think I have like 47 different story ideas on my board right now. 47? Yeah, ish. That's fun. But see, some you, of which are great, <laughs> so, and some of which remain to be seen. I mean, also though, it's only pejorative if you never make things, right? It's only yeah. If you never gets out of, if you never get out of that, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, gestation. <laughs> Do well, we want to use that word? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. You're the one yes. who's had many ideas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The ideas are the fun part. But I should we be recording this? Is this? Yeah, yeah. What are we're, we talking we're about going. Today? I yeah. well, I want to. I want to lay ideas. Some, I want. <laughs> I wanted to lay some bait in front of you about lay some uh, bait. Have you seen the LOTR trailer? <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> I oh. thought we just needed to lead into t- today's episode to let people know. Oh, good, good golly! <laughs> I can pull it up for you if you want. No, I've seen it. Yeah, Rings of yeah. Power, the trailer. Uh... <laughs> I, oh. the the whole internet is i don't know if you've seen the one youtube version of it is overwhelmed by russians quoting tolkien in russian about the corruption of evil yeah the, how, the corruption of good yeah yeah how evil can't make anything on its own yep. i mean you just see post after post of russian comments all with thousands of likes and you yep. google translate them and find out they're quoting tolkien at the first the very first one the first quotes in english and then <laughs> every and it's so the translation is the first quote yeah that evil is just the corruption of good. Evil can't make anything itself. And then it's just that quote over and over and over again. And it's mostly in Russian <laughs> after that fact, which is really funny. So are we start? Have we, have we started yet? Yeah, we've started. We've officially started. Yeah. Welcome to Stories of Soul Food. We've officially started. You've been with us already for a minute. Or You've two. already joined us. We started talking about ideas and being an idea man. Is that yeah. in this episode? We're going to include yeah, that? Yeah, for or? sure. Include okay. it. Yeah. Brian accused me of being an ideas man. Oh, that was a compliment. It's one of Which my favorite true. compliments. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm an ideas man. <laughs> I have good ones and bad ones. And the bad ones are the ones I like the most. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I love them because I, I am very drawn to the ideas that would shock and awe. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about an idea is if you never make it, you never have to let go of it. So yeah. <laughs> you can keep I it do. forever. I have always been the person, though, who hates it when people say, do you know what would be funny? It would be funny if dot, 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 we did fill in the blank and everybody laughs like, haha, that would be funny. I've always been the person who thought, do you know, do you know what would be funnier? Is if we actually did that, it'd be mm. much, fu- much funnier to yeah. actually do that. Not just to say it'd be funny if we. No, it'll be hilarious if we actually do it. But it's not Don't funny say, just to talk about. Yeah, it. it's not funny to say it'd be so funny if we climbed up on that building and changed that sign. Oh, is this real life? That's real life. <laughs> <laughs> it would be funny if we did that. So yeah, you, you, it would be funny if we did that. It would not be funny if we said it would be funny if we did that. It'll be much funnier if we do that. Got it. So, so there's a break there. Yeah. It's sort of like when people want to tell you their dreams. Yeah. You, you, Gosh. You know, that's not interesting. If it actually happened to you that you actually shot your friend. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Okay. Interesting. Now we have a story. Interesting. But dreaming that I you I dreamt thought- I shot my friend is, Okay. Interesting. Not really. Sorry. Next person in line. It would be funny if you did shoot your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I would put it that way, but it is, it is very much the case that plenty of people say, do you know what would be a great movie is if, do you know what would be a great story is if, and then they walk away like they've scratched the itch. Mm. And I think ideas should be itchier than that. Yeah. I love having ideas, but I, I have a whole herd of them. I have a massive 
massive herd of ideas and some of them are really stuck and I ha they have to happen. Like they, these are stories that just must occur or they'll just be with me until they occur or until I die. Like I, these have to come into existence. Uh, but stories that don't have to happen. Like I had an idea for a story and now I don't have to tell it. I don't have to shape it. I don't have to read it or see it or any of those things. They, that's how you know it wasn't a great idea. Mm. The really, the really good ideas are ideas that will compel you to, to actually do it, to actually put the time in to make it happen. And the, the sign we changed, by the way, there was a little dirt, dirt bag nightclub in town that the dirt bag nightclub owner had some dirt bag nightclub owner idea, which was to have a high school bikini contest. Ooh. And so he wanted to bring in underage girls to have a bikini contest. Not that I approve of it when we do it with overage girls, but right he he was gonna do it's, underage girls it's another level of dirt They're yeah this dirty. was back in like the year 2000 i think yeah way back and so on the corner of third and main in moscow idaho a nightclub at the time called the beach subtitle a place to party mm. he put on the sign high school bikini contest you know underage girls could come have their little bikini contest on the stage and only underage people allowed like only underage people were allowed to come watch what? just to try to like dodge the, uh, the, the per pedophile per yeah, the thing, but it was factor. like, other than the fact that he was there and he, the hmm, bartender, the, well, other everyone. than the fact that the whole thing's grody. Okay. There's no yeah, way yeah. there's just the whole thing is gross. So we thought, do you know what would be funny is if we changed the sign to say preschool bikini contest, just to make it even more clear. Wow. Like let's yeah, change what? it. So high school bikini contest, let's change it to preschool bikini contest, because as long as we're going to be pervs here at this nightclub, a beach, a place to party. So we, we did, we, we, yeah. Cause it didn't stop there. The idea did not stop. There no. for me. <laughs> so a couple of us, some of whom were related to me, some of whom are current business partners, some of whom were just friends, <laughs> went down and <laughs> slapped some cardboard and duct tape over the security cameras and threw a friend of ours up onto the sign. And it was up on the second story and he got it changed to preschool bikini contest. And it was the front page of the newspaper the next day. It's much funnier to live the story and live the joke to actually do the thing than to say, it would be great if we, mm. um, and that same way for fiction, for movies, for everything, much but, better to tell it, to do it. Well, I think we to have to dig it. deeper into satire right now. Right. You, you have, we've made it a necessity. So, so the question is, what's the point of doing that? Of having changed that? Yeah. Uh, cause I think some people will hear that and not get it. They don't. Get the only it. point was to more clearly reveal to the simple minded, the perversion he was engaged in. Cause there'd be a fair number of our small towns, denizens who would say, Oh, you know, it's just up for high school kids. It's high school kids. It's high school. They should be able to party if they want to. <laughs> right. So it made the front page of the newspaper and actually plenty of people are like, I can't believe he's doing that. They fully believe the sign was, he was actually doing a preschool. <laughs> well, it's on the sign and it's with those letters, <laughs> yes. that, letters that you can't move unless you have one of those little sign arm things. So it was preschool. <laughs> they were even the wrong size. So we had to like duct tape the letters in place. My friend did, but it was like preschool bikini contest. People just believed it. Other people knew it was an immediate joke. It was satire. It was mocking. So you're trying to prey on, on girls. Like, why do you draw the line here? Yeah. You said high school. So ninth yeah. graders, you, you'd let ninth graders into this. Why not eighth grader? Why not sixth grader? Why not preschool? Yeah. So we just pushed it. He had no natural line. And so we just brought attention to the fact that he had no natural line. Yeah. We then, since uh, we didn't tell him this, but Aaron Wrench, who was one of the guys involved that night, uh, he and I have since purchased that building recently. From that guy. So really. it was your own property anyway. Yeah. Now we have the old newspaper, so we're going to frame it and hang it somewhere. We have the front page of the newspaper. And so we feel like that was the moment when we marked it as our territory. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and so 20 years later, we've now acquired uh, that building and it will not be a dirt bag nightclub anymore. Yeah. And it will no longer be engaged in such dirt baggery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the satire there is defending people. Right. Yeah, you're, you're, you're defending girls with You're flagging sign. somebody as a perv and this is gross and everybody laugh at this dirt bag. Yeah. Like, yep. you know, can we please, please put a big blinking light on top of this? 
and there's make the, everybody aware that this is gross. And as with many of those sorts of pointed ideas, it's at an inescapable concept where it's not whether someone's going to be made fun of. It's which people are going to be laughed at. Which people are going to be laughed at. The uptight Christians. Yep. You gonna laugh at the uptight Christians, or are you gonna laugh at the dirtbags? Right. Are you going to be the people? And and that's awesome too because the I don't think we should be doing this line is something that Christians have. There are numbers of ways of saying, "Hey, I don't think we should do this," and it's and it, Christians haven't been great no. at, at making that claim and then making it in a winsome way that sounds that's that tastes like salt, nope. the salt of the nope. the earth. We have traditionally been poor when it comes to that. I think our Here default in move is, is only the boycott, and that's maybe yeah. one of our better ones. I'd say not even the boycott. Boycott the the default move is the fuss. Mm, yeah, we fuss. We threaten the boycott, and we fuss. Right, and we fuss about double standards, and we fuss about whatever it is, and we fuss, and that is what we do, unfortunately. Yeah, and what we need to be doing is laughing and feasting and having fun and telling better stories. And living better lives and living them publicly and joyfully. Right. And that's it. Yeah. So that's there, what, that's the podcast. <laughs> what are we that's, talking? That's what we do with ideas. Yeah. What's <laughs> Execute. the, uh, what are we actually talking about today, Brian? Well, I, I, Oh, the Lord of the Rings. I did. Oh, yeah. my gracious sakes of goodness. <laughs> Could there be a worse expenditure of money? 450 millions this. of it. Well, so much more. I think it's it's absurdly more than that. I've I've been really? told I've been given giant numbers, like giant numbers for what the visual Wait, effects. It's already are. the most expensive yeah. TV series ever. 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 Half a billion dollars. Uh I think they threw a quarter B into the rights. Oh, you're right. So that means 450 in production. I believe it's they, the yeah. stated number. Plus the 250 in rights. I did see that. Then I, there's a, there's some. Also, we should be clear. It's rights to the appendices. Yeah, right. So they don't own anything of the Silmarillion. No real I think it was a quarter stories. billion. I think it was a quarter billion yeah. for the rights. And then the 450 million, almost half a billion for the production. And then I believe, this is what I've been told. So I have a different in like industry scuttlebutt uh, about the amount being spent on visual effects and the visual effects ramp up. Also, the amount that was invested into Australia, New Zealand, that they walked away from, especially New Zealand because of COVID, that they just walked away from. Yeah, because they did the second season in England instead of New yep. Zealand. And so, so they, they left all that there. Yeah, they just walked. Uh, <laughs> but then, uh, and then there's questions. I've like dubious numbers thrown out to me about the, about the visual effects setup and whether, and like, how is it being written off? And is it being written off across multiple shows with this visual effects investment, something they were using on like Wheel of Time and Lord of the Rings here, bringing the rings of power? Mm -hmm. Like, how is this, how is that number being defrayed? But the numbers I have been given for the visual effects investment at Amazon is, is bigger than the entirety of that number. No, it's so, not. Yep. But the, <laughs> and I, I have not confirmed that. I can't confirm that. Right. I'm just saying different different people on the inside have told me that that's the amount being invested is absurd. So that number would be a piece of that, like that 450 yeah. would include production and other things. And some of that would be visual effects, but the visual effects investment is Astronom huge. It's astronomical. astronomical and involves a massive ramp up, basically the creation of visual effects studios, et cetera, right. that are going to be just designated for this. And then hopefully we'll be defrayed across other projects and other things. But are still being, you know, it, it's odd. I don't know how the bookkeeping's going and I don't have access to it. All I know, all we know for sure is that these numbers are insanely high. So insanely high. And the investment into content is insanely high for it to look like Hallmark. That was the question I had. Just had a weird greasy baby. What, what, it, yeah, what happened? With a gnome figurine. <laughs> It's a golden with weird. Like, what are you doing? This is the worst. Hashtag the worst. <laughs> and not even with a U. <laughs> this is the straight up worst. I was just in a writer's room of this last week working on a show and in LA, and they said, Have you seen this yet? And I was like, We were talking about how much the Wheel of Time show sucked. 
I mean, it sucked. I've only seen the preview. <laughs> <laughs> and it was oh, so sad. I'm not like a, a major Wheel of Time fan, but the, there is a lot to respect in the early books of the Wheel of Time series. They had Rosamund Pike, who is an amazingly talented actress. Like She is a really gifted actress. They had a really strong piece of IP. Mm-hmm. They had a huge fan base to start with, yep. with Wheel of Time. And they laid a giant fuzzy egg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that thing came out moldy. I mean, it's just a, it's bad. It is so bad. Mm. It's like somebody's nephew's best friend got to design the Trolloc costumes, like these mm. monster costumes. It's just bad. The casting is bad. The narrative is bad. Mm. The woke insertions are horrific. Like, hey, let's take the main character here of the early episodes and make her a lesbian. <laughs> and it'll be amazing. <laughs> I mean, you th- uh, let's and all the 11 million fans that we're starting with the starter dough that we have to grow into like a, an organic grassroots movement. Let's make them all angry. Let's start off by having 11 million angry people instead of 11 million excited people. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we successfully market something. Yeah. Anyway, oh, wheel man. of time. How do we so we're ask- talking about this. This is all yeah. backstory too. talking about, you know, when Hollywood, the model just breaks or things break. We're talking about the way streaming has kind of changed the def- like the metric for success, the metric for failure, and the ways in which these things are measured and, and, and all those things. And then somebody said, have you seen the Rings of Power trailer? And I was like, <laughs> I have. <laughs> and we're like, somebody in the room hadn't. And everybody was like, it's so bad. Like worse than Wheel of Time. Oh, wow. And it's like, it can't be worse. It can't be. Various people were doubters. It Mm -hmm. can't be worse than we have. Surely it cannot be. Yeah. Oh, but it can. (laughs) (laughs) So they threw it up on the big screen in the room we were all working on and working in. And yeah, unanimous vote from everybody there. Unanimous. That this is unwatchable. Yeah. Unwatchable. Now, this is a group of people that 100% love Tolkien. Every single person in the room was a Tolkien fan. Define that, and you go underneath that, maybe two of us in the room had actually read the books. Okay, there you go. The rest of the people in the room had were fans of the Jackson films, not the Hobbit franchise as much, but the original Jackson films. 100% spit it out disgust in reaction to the trailer for Rings of Power. Why are we looking at this kind of makeup, this kind of costuming? What? I think as the French would say, in all hell have they done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't even know what to say. Like it's how does the visual effects get like that? Or how do you the golden light? I don't understand every decision. The from- makeup even for the costume I mean, before the golden light. Mm. Like you you look at the the rosy cheekedness and the little the frizzy hairness. Oh of the, yeah, of the fake hobbits. It's like, what are you doing? Mm. And then then yes, let's have black elves and they're dating white elves. I, whatever, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like that's that has nothing to do with anything. But it this whole thing disgusts me. I mean, it just really is gross. It's gross, and it's not like you look at Game of Thrones and you say, okay, so here's this here's this uh, situation over here with the Game of Thrones thing, and you think what people did not complain about with Game of Thrones was the visual effects. Yeah, the show looked visually very So one I thing. don't know anybody who said Game of Thrones is terrible because the visual effects suck and the makeup and the costuming, right? Anybody who has a problem with Game of Thrones has a problem with Game of Thrones because of the filth. Right. Right? Absolutely. Like, because it's here, jump down here and wallow in the filth. That's mm-hmm. that's our every brand. Every episode. That's our brand. Every time, every way. But everybody acknowledges that this and we like last week we talked about technical value, et cetera. Everybody acknowledges the technical craft of the visual effects, everything else, costuming, the world building. I believe the pilot for Game of Thrones cost $18 million, and that's because they threw it away and did it over. Like well, They actually made it, and they said, this kind of sucks, and so they threw it away, and they did it again. And it still only cost? $18 million, and they did it twice. Wow. So, ex- it's, I mean, compared to the money we were talking about. Explain to me 
uh, in the words of that little flash animation viral video, explain to me <laughs> the contrails. <laughs> yes, explain to me where did all this money go? Why is it so bad? Be a Q as <laughs> be a Q as pebble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you haven't seen that one, we should put that in the show notes. There we go. Dot dot dot. <laughs> a review uh, by X Men Thirteen. <laughs> I will. I will not yeah. forget. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Anyway, explain to me how on earth you lose half a billion dollars somewhere in the couch on this show. When you could do, yeah. Like, if HBO can do a pilot episode, which I will say, I've now, I've now watched the pilot episode of Game of Thrones. Earlier, when we started this illustrious podcast, I had not. Uh, for work, I've now had to. Not great. Okay. Like, not like, great how? Just like, like grip and clunky and slow and it's a pilot you gotcha. know but man i think we can all agree it worked kind of like roped people in mm -hmm. people watched the show nobody could say that game of thrones was not watched right you know amazon would be lucky if they could capture the viewership of game of thrones but the budget for this one is insanity complete and total insanity so i i really don't understand i don't understand how this happens i don't know where all the money went well my I question was know. it's also written by two people who have no other credits to their name and i wanted to ask you what's do you know what what's happening with that they say we know it's weird we haven't ever worked on anything before but this project is just perfect for us that is weird i didn't pay enough attention to even know that so yeah, no, I was reading on it and looking up who the screenwriters were and they said, you know, our whole challenge is can we write, <laughs> this is a quote, basically, can we write a story that Tolkien never wrote, wrote the novel that he never wrote based on the appendices? Well, sure. And yeah. the answer was, <laughs> yes, yes, yes and you Especially could. if you're getting paid nine and a half million an episode. Yeah. In Bitcoin, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I, no, I don't know. I'm just saying oh, like, oh yeah. They had yeah. to blow this cash somewhere. Right. I mean- the rosy cheeked makeup didn't cost that much money. Yeah. The really bad landscapes and But I mean that opening shot over the CG wall had to be pretty impressive, right? You could have built a Mandalorian 360 John Favreau soundstage for every individual character for less money than this. I, mean, I don't I don't get it. I don't understand it. So what they should have done is just bought a coffee for every single Prime subscriber just to cheer everybody up. Instead of wasting this money, <laughs> like if they'd sent every single Prime subscriber like a Starbucks card for five bucks, they could have just not done this. They could have blown all. Yeah. What are they at? They they're at a. I want to say they're at like a hundred and ten or hundred twenty million Prime subscribers. Mm. I just buy us. I'm one of those. Just buy us all a coffee. Yeah. Send us all to Starbucks. Yeah. And then we won't have to have our eyes assaulted with this. Yeah. I mean, I. I don't know how this stuff happens. I don't. I, get, you, I wish you, I could explain it. Okay. All right. I mean, I don't under, I mean, every check and balance possible in, in that much money. And apparently no one asking big picture questions. There is a, there is an issue though. Well, this is, this is the general, this is the biggest issue is for Amazon more than anybody else. So this is an issue for all streamers, but when you're dealing with streaming content, I have a, a producer friend who was, on a big project. I won't tell you, I won't tell all you people through this microphone which project, because I'd be betraying a confidence. But he was <laughs> he was on a big project. It was a he. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a big project, great film, successful on Netflix. But Netflix talked the producers into going on to Netflix with this what would have been wide theatrical released project by saying on Netflix. There's no metric for failure. When we release it, we'll just tell everybody it was a hit. Oh, interesting. And then it just will be. Once we've said it is, everybody will have to watch it. You know, like it's just, we'll be excited about it. We'll push it. There's no metric for failure. There is no failure. If you take it out, you're running a risk in the current theatrical market. You're running a massive risk that you could lay an egg, potentially a fuzzy egg, <laughs> but you're going you're gonna to lay an egg. And so they took it to Netflix. You know, they just wrote them a check for their budget plus, you know, whatever percentage it was, 20%, so they could make all their money back and then make some profit and stick the, mo stick the movie on, on uh, I don't know what the exact terms were, stick the movie on Netflix and have everybody call it a win. You know, mm -hmm. big success. 
So that's Netflix. Netflix, their motivation for buying content, they have two big motivations. One is to bring in subscribers. So right. the kind of the kind of big tentpole now, tentpole movies uh, on a streamer would be the kind of movies that make people subscribe. Tentpole shows make people subscribe. Right. Where before a tentpole movie would be a movie that launches a franchise that can be in theaters. So like the first Spider-Man movie is you know, like a tentpole movie and so on. And then other things can exist underneath that tentpole. There's a whole ecosystem and so on. So what, Mar- what Marvel did and pioneered, well, they really dialed it in. But you now have the situation where Netflix wants movies that will either bring in subscribers or limit what they call churn. Churn is when people just subscribe briefly, briefly then cancel. Yep. So okay. they're here, then they cancel. So lots of kids shows, lots of cartoons, because mama can't cancel Johnny's favorite show. So all that content is to prevent churn. Other content is to draw people in. So you have recruit people, keep people, recruit people, keep people, right? So that's for HBO Max, for Netflix, for these other Disney Plus, for these other streamers, that's the model. The model is content that brings people in. You have to see Baby Yoda. I have to see Man- yeah, the Mandalorian. You have to see these things. things. So you have to come. You have to see it. You have yep. to be part of the zeitgeist. You have to be part of the cultural conversation. You need the streamers. You need, you need to bring it in. And then the, the second piece is we have enough stuff that you can't cancel. New things are dropping. There's stuff that keeps you from canceling. Amazon's different because... Amazon executives are stuck sitting here with this metric for how do we get more people to subscribe to Prime? Well, you make an amazing show and people are still subscribing to Prime because they want free shipping. Yeah. They want their dish soap to arrive without paying for shipping. So did that show make anybody else subscribe to Prime in any way? I mean, no. (laughs) Not really. And Bezos wanted vanity projects, meaning he wanted gold statues. So Bezos wanted legacy projects. He wanted, you know, transparent. He wanted shows that would get acclaim. He wanted like Oscars, wokey yeah. woke, zeitgeisty stuff. Unlike Netflix, unlike Disney, you know, Disney Plus, unlike Apple, Apple TV, other stuff, Apple Plus and Apple TV, all these things. Apple TV being a different service, by the way. Apple Plus. It's all very confusing. And I still don't know what the plus is for, by the way. I want somebody to do a minus sometime. <laughs> This is less than what you get with our usual <laughs> offerings. Yeah, yes. Well, Canon Plus. Even less. Canon yeah, Plus. Canon, Plus. Canon, Canon Plus. Plus stories are soul food. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Canon Plus SAS. Yeah. So over at Amazon, they have this problem of like, okay, so the boss wanted statues. And then did we increase our subscriber base? Yeah. Do people churn? No. Because if anybody subscribes, they want free shipping. Right. So, you know, it's kind of a weird, kind of weird deal. Plus the prime library and other things. There's just a lot going on over there at Amazon that keeps you from churning already. So what on earth is this studio for? Like what are Amazon originals for? Man in the High Castle was successful. Did it increase Amazon Prime subscribers? I don't think so. You no, know, I guess I don't know. I don't think it did. Do people buy it? You well, can you can rent it on Prime, right? But yeah, I don't think anyone. Yeah, but the thing is that you have a situation where the ecosystem of prime members was so vast. Like there's so many people already. They didn't have to, they weren't like Disney plus where they had to just roll out and then start building subscriber base. They already had yeah. over a hundred million prime subscribers Yeah, for free shipping. They'd already destroyed the post office, reinvented the post office. They're, they had already destroyed a lot of physical retail. They'd already replaced the American Book shopping stores. experience. <laughs> <Book know>. stores. <laughs> yeah. Like Amazon's already massive and they start dropping original content to their existing subscriber pool so they could have really big hit shows and there's no metric for success <laughs> yeah like how do we measure what we're doing and what the goal is at all and so i think they had to this is in their defense i think they had to make a play this big okay like okay so if we're going to use movies and shows to bring in subscribers to amazon who are not already subscribing to amazon prime it has to be rhinormous it has to be a huge play so I understand making a half a billion dollar Lord of the Rings play. I get that. But man, if you're going to do that. <laughs> how, mu- how much did Stranger Things cost? I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think like that seems like they built if Amazon had something like that, maybe people would join for that. Or do you think so it needs I've to be had even conversations bigger? with guys recently where it's like you're looking at five million an episode for a really strong period or fantasy live action show. 
And wow. that could go up when you're big. When you're big, you, you could bounce up to 10. You could get up beyond that. But, you know, it's, you know, not you're not, much. you are not talking in the hundreds of millions, you know, at all. So. So you think they're just. Until, like, until success. Right. So once it's successful and once people are tuning in and the stakes are being raised and you're growing and growing and growing, you could be, you could be growing to 15 million an episode. But that's, you're talking, well, we could Google it. It would take a. It would take a minute. I don't remember what the Game of Thrones uh, budgets were by the end, but they were not small. They were about as big as they get for TV, and they were still, you know, I want to say under 20. There might have been one for more than 20. Okay. Um, but I don't know. I should fact check that. As far as Amazon goes, they needed, they needed to make a giant, giant, huge investment. Like it, had to be, it had to be a huge play. And in order to do that, it needed to be huge, high profile, Okay, big so expensive Tolkien, IP. Tolkien checks that. Global, you know, yeah. all those things. And then in doing that, they just, the only big screw up was now you did a high profile suck, right? So according to the internets, the sixth season budget was over 10 million per episode. Okay. Um, Six million to eight million was the average budget. Like, okay. Hmm. I just don't understand. It sounds like a massive- hundred million was a record for a series production cost, a season total of 100 million, a record at the time for one season. I just don't understand how you could spend that much money. I still am there. And I don't even understand it. It's just- Well, glowing hobbits are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Galadriel looking like a drowned water rat <laughs> turning into girl boss. <laughs> Does she turn into a girl boss? I was hoping that she would- No, did you, know, you be... not see her in armor? Oh, yeah. I didn't even know it was Gladriel. I didn't track that. I just knew it was a chick in armor. You probably... No, that's her. That's... Oh, good. Yep. Well, there's that to look forward to. Yep. I don't know that I could ever even get through the pilot episode. I don't know that I could. I, do we owe it to Tolkien not to? Or Should we reaction we to... watch it? Should we do a podcast we, or we I actually think we kind of have to. <laughs> do we mystery science theater this thing? <laughs> also, you might have missed Elrond. He had the wavy hair from the 90s. Oh, he good. Was the little well, as we guy. all know, the elves in the ancient days, they were big into the 90s. He's described as a canny architect. Ooh. That's Elrond. Canny. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I hate is an uncanny architect. <laughs> it's a real dumb one. <laughs> uncanny. This, this architect is uncanny. I wonder, bring me a canny one. <laughs> <laughs> An uncanny architect. That's terrible. All the way terrible. Anyway, I kind of ranted, but I, I feel like Amazon is in a very unique place where they're trying to motivate people to subscribe to Prime and they need to make a massive bet to do that. And the problem is that when you make a massive bet and you say it needs to be massive and that's, that's what you decide at the outset, you're not saying, hey, we got this IP and we need this to be excellent. You're saying we have to make a massive bet. And so you paid a quarter billion dollars for the rights. Like, okay, you're already in a massive bet now. Mm -hmm. And what now? No, let's make it truly, truly excellent. Like, well, what's the only way that giant corporations know to try to motivate excellence? Throw money. Yeah. Give something a huge, yeah. a huge budget. Well, I remember everyone was freaking out at the beginning because they'd hired an intimacy coordinator for Lord of the Rings series. Of course. But now they recently came out and said, hey, we're not trying to do Game of Thrones. There was no intimacy that needed coordination. <laughs> <laughs> we just paid the salary because we had the money. <laughs> that was just for the crew. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood or whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, in the same writer's room, we were having conversations. This is getting derailed, but we're having conversations about just the brokenness of the industry. And I was imagining, envisioning a scene where somebody went and applied for a job at H&R Block and their future employer handed them the contract. It's like, so the nudity clauses are all on page three. <laughs> where oh that's cuts you a know, little too hard at any point your your boss may require you to get naked man you might get naked but don't worry we have an intimacy coordinator on staff who will make sure that nothing untoward happens hmm. other than you being required to get naked also other people will watch yeah it's like well but under what in under which circumstances would i be required by my boss at h&r block to get naked Man. and it's like oh don't worry we'd only do it on camera to sell it to people for money yeah that's crazy like yeah that's what hollywood does and and just take that into any other industry you know it's and like, icky it, it turns out it's gross requires it's, a change in the sign outside, the, outside yeah, the business <laughs> it's all the way gross 
Yeah, we should change that sign from high school bikini contest to preschool bikini contest. It's disgusting. It's all the way disgusting. So, and we would see it clearly, the whole of America would see it clearly if it was any other industry. Mm. Here, I'm applying for a job at a garbage, you know, garbage truck company. Well, so your any superior might at some point require you to yeah. drop trow. <laughs> it's, That's so weird. It's like it's in your contract. And in Hollywood, you're you're sitting here and you have to actually sign these contracts with these with these blank nudity clauses, especially at the beginning of a show when you've not read all the scripts, right? So So you can't just say no, I decline, or but then you wouldn't get the job, I guess. Is, how do they handle that kind of you thing? You could get sued by your agent for the commission they're losing. You can, yes. And so you could read the pilot script and there's no nudity in the pilot script. There's no nudity planned, whatever, but there could be a nudity clause in the contract still. Oh, this is our, this is just boilerplate. This is just, and you're a starving artist. You're trying to make it. Should rethink your priorities and your goals, but it's, you know, you're trying to go and you don't know what they're going to do later in the season. You don't know what's going to happen later, et cetera, but you sign the contract and then they come at you later. It's okay. We hear, we wrote this interesting episode for you. Like, uh, and you find yourself under a legal obligation to remove your clothing, to remove your clothing. <laughs> well, like what? Ah, woof. Now, if you say no, like, okay, there's a line out the door of people who want that job, but you could get sued by your agent and yeah. it has happened. Okay. So one of the, one of the directors I was hanging out with working with this last week was telling me, oh yeah, I know plenty of people who've actually said, no, I will not sign this vague contract that allows for the possibility of something happening later I don't want to be involved in. And they were sued, fired and sued by their own agents mm. for the lost commission. So, you know, it's, it's incredibly nuts. Yikes. So anyway, allowed, all this to say Hollywood's terrible. Are we allowed to inquire what you were working on? Uh, this was all King David show. Wow. So that's exciting. Yes, it is working on it, working on it. It's not real yet, but hopefully getting real fast. Wow. So, there's an optimistic end to our episode. Yeah, working <laughs> on it. Oh, we have a bunch of episodes written, working through different passes, outlining uh, the exact breaks for a first season, what a first season would look like, where the second season would go, et cetera. So cool. I've written a couple scripts and more to do, but it's a not a gentle story. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and that's why all these issues have come up, right? So. You know, this is um, the people at the top of this, the people who are committed to it are committed believers and are not interested in taking it into any kind of worldly or, or twisted directions. They want to they want to stay true to the biblical narrative. But the biblical narrative is dark. Yeah, as we and, discussed lots of times. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how, how this all goes. But the goal is for this to be a reality and we're working on it hard and I'm fitting everything else into the cracks right now. So it's, it's taken a lot of, taken a lot of time and there are a ton of things shaken up in the industry right now, which are exciting mm. and we'll see how it all post COVID when all the truckers have put the world to rights, we will, uh, God bless those guys. God bless those truckers. <laughs> those are people who could see the story they're in right now. Yep. Like we've talked about that before too. Like, who am I? What do I have available to me? <laughs> like, yeah. and how do I move the needle for goodness and truth? In this particular moment, we ha- um, we have our Canadian flag flying outside of our house right now. How do I? <laughs> is there a semi on it? How do <laughs> how do I make the boy king of Canada just a little bit sadder tomorrow? Uh, that's what they ask themselves. His face droops just a little <laughs> just more, a <laughs> little bit droopy. I do. That's my favorite reference to Trudeau right now. Is the boy king of the Canada? Boy king <laughs> the boy of king of Canada. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there's a. Uh, what else do we need to cover today? That's it. Do we have any questions about last week about watching movies? Uh, I think everybody's digesting it. They liked it. Interesting. Heard, people say, ooh, in the comments. Ooh. ooh. I came back. So from this trip in LA, my kids watched The Prestige when I was gone. And I came back to a lot of questions. <laughs> and it was funny because I was thinking about that episode and talking to them. And uh, we started by me asking them how much they paid attention. And they're like, oh yeah, no, we totally paid attention. I was like, okay, who directed it? Mm. Who directed the film? And a couple of them were like, oh. <laughs> and a, f- a few of them knew. I think, uh, let's say four of them watched it. Two of them knew, two of them didn't. Who'd done it? And what else has he done? 
And, you know, it's like that kind of thing is actually important. Even though I went off about the filmmaker's intent is not actually what matters. It does provide you a strong lead and clue as you start to digest what's going on. So when you realize that it's, it's Christopher Nolan and what else has he done? And they're like the Batman trilogy, that trilogy, that particular trilogy, I run because they need me to run. <laughs> um, and Inception. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so let's talk about what this film's exploring specifically. Knowing what you know about him now, like what, is this, what does this bring out? Does it bring out anything new to you? Because it's just weird. It's just a weird story, right? Mm -hmm. So given its weirdness, what do you think he's, he's thinking through? It's like, well, he's, he's fundamentally, fundamentally postmodern. So we ended up talking about a correspondence theory of truth and like when does perception become reality? When is it not a trick? When is something not actually an illusion, not actually a trick, but it's just real? Hmm. And like, so Bat Batman need, doesn't need to be the villain. He, he's going to be the villain because they, they need one. And it doesn't matter that he's not. Like, which, yeah. is, which is real? Is there any objective truth? Is there any objective truth at all? And it was like, oh, like the lights all kind of came on. There are things yeah. about the prestige they liked and things that they really didn't like. And, you know, but it really started a big conversation about just kind of the weirdness of postmodernism and what it does to storytelling. Yeah. I've been reading up a little bit on the structuralists and how they worked their whole little scientific lives to divorce meaning from actual words yeah you know their whole and that set us up for everything we're at yeah. right now and here we are so with inception and like the little spinning top that won't topple and nolan's you know nolan loves leaving it like which is real you don't know if it's real but also always the question is does it matter like is anything more real than anything else is is perception less real than reality like mm. and that's always something that he plays around with yeah and, and always has and so the prestige is, you know, toys with that and plays with that, just like everything else. It's just part of his progression. And, uh, but it was funny not being there with them, having them watch it. And then I was, I was in LA, then I came back and, and they were separately. I had, I had two separate conversations with kids. Um, my son was off at a basketball game. And so afterwards he was like, we watched the prestige when you were gone. So I had the conversation a second time with, with him, Yeah, but with his sisters separately. And they were all. It was very much on the response value thing, very much something that provoked a lot of thought for them. Like, what on earth is going on with this? Mm -hmm. Like, what is he doing? There's just the weirdness of the plot. Yeah. And you know, kind of the goofiness of the plot. But what's the motivation? Like, why is he wondering about this? What's he playing with? And not to spoil it for anybody who's thinking about watching it, but the, the whole trick is not a trick in the prestige. Right. right. It's real. And he has to make people think it's a trick in order for them to not freak out as much. Right. But um, anyway. Yeah. I was thinking about that last podcast. Like, yep, came back and here I am in the conversation with my kids. Right. And I think one thing, we one question we did get was just some mom saying, I mean, I ask a question and then everyone just kind of sits there. Any advice for her? Lead the conversation. Process out loud. Yeah. You don't have to have a take. Yeah. That's like the take right now. Right. It's not a multiple choice. It's not like fill in the blank. You, it's not just empty space and it's also something where there's plenty of times where you watch something and you think you can ask something like what do you think of that character like do you like that character do you not like that character why right and then you, if they're having trouble answering just be like i i kind of like him like i mean i i kind of like this guy obviously i think he shouldn't be doing this yeah he'd be more likable if he did that i think kids you know it's are, like right you just start leading in processing, like start to process, but start to take apart individual characters, but also writer's decisions. Like I kind of think and start thinking like a writer yourself and say, I wish the writer had, like, I wish the writer had let him, you know, not make that choice or taken him in a different direction or, yeah, you know, it's like, this is what I, this is what I like about him. I would like him more if. Right. I think kids are really, they're really aware when you're setting them up with a trap. Where if, if it's like they're they're scared of being wrong, right? Like yeah, and so the the key is for you to think through it and process it and kind of wrestle it to the ground, and it's it's way more like trying to wrestle something or trying to carry a couch in the into the house from the van, where there's not a, it's not as much like there's a lot of ways to drop the couch, there's a lot of ways to frustrate everybody, but ultimately your goal is just to like start, you right. know, just try to get it a little further than you normally do, <laughs> like, right? Right. So. 
processing yourself and doing it in front of them is great. I still do that with my kids. I don't act like there's an emphatic answer when there's not, you know, like there's, there's times when there is, but, um, there's a lot of times when I'm telling them, I would like this character a little better if he did this Mm -hmm. that way. And I'm asking them what do you like, they tell me who they like and I'm asking why and make, just making them even process their own responses, like process the causes of their reactions and so on. So it's not all just philosophy and worldview. It's, a lot more organic and roll up your sleeves and get down in the garden and, and get your hands dirty. Right. You know, pull weeds, leave right. this plant, throw that one away. Just kind of root through it. Hopefully that helps. That's great. The end. The end. We kind of wandered all over the place. The real, the real ending here is will Brian and I watch whatever that thing was. <laughs> I don't remember. Ring the of thing Lords. That, ring of Lords. Ring of, ring of Lords of, of, Power. The Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Ring of the Lords of the Amazon of visual effects. Or will we forget by the time September comes <laughs> that it's even happening? Or will we just be playing When September Ends by Green Day yeah. and not watching? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We might be doing a Mystery Science Theater watch. We might not be. We just might not be up to sucking on that big a lemon. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe 10 minutes of it. Yeah, seven. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Yet. Until next time. <laughs> Hi, it's Brian Cole here, wanting to let you know how you can support the Stories Our Soul Food podcast. You can do that by checking out Canon Plus. Head over to mycanonplus.com. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the SASF podcast. We'll hopefully be seeing you at mycanonplus.com.